So in our discussion of magnetism, we'll basically be dealing with four, four issues. And uh, the next couple of weeks we'll focus on magnetism. The four issues that we're going to look at are as follows. First of all, moving charges produce a magnetic field. The second point we would investigate, this is something we're going to look at today. The second point which we'll look at in the subsequent lectures is that a moving charge experiences a force in a magnetic field. The third thing we'll look at is what are magnetic materials? What are the different kinds of magnetism that are allowed by physics? What is magnetism in matter? Okay. Why do some objects become magnetic? What is meant by magnetic? What is a non-magnetic object? And so on. And the fourth issue that we'll deal with is what is a magnetic field? You see, <clears throat> and this is quite strange because common sense would have it that when we're discussing magnetic fields and magnetism, first of all, we'll define what a magnetic field is. How does a magnetic field come about? And what really is a magnetic field? How is it different from an electric field? But this is coming right at the end. So we'll start off by describing how moving charges produce magnetic fields and still we don't know what are magnetic fields. We'll describe how moving charges experiences forces, experience forces in magnetic fields but we don't know what are really magnetic fields. We'll be talking about magnetism but we don't really know what are magnetic fields. This topic comes at the very end because of a certain reason. The reason is present in the theory of special relativity, something that you've already seen in your mechanics class. So we'll build up on those concepts and describe that a magnetic field is a relativistic effect. An electric field can act as a magnetic field. There could be forces, there could be fields that one person qualifies as an electric field, but another person who's moving qualifies the same field as a magnetic field. Field. So electric fields can become magnetic fields in moving frames. So this is something we're going to describe. So electricity and magnetism are basically two faces of the same coin. Magnetism is a relativistic effect. And this is something I'll explain at the very end. Okay? But first of all, I would like to describe some common sensical, common experience observations. And I would like to start off by this. And I would like to recall a physics lecture from 1821, about 190 years ago, by a Dutch physicist, Orsted. And he was giving a lecture to his students. And what he basically had was, uh, could you just focus on everything? So he had a wire. Okay, we turn off the lights a little bit. You will be asked about it. All right. So, Orsted had a wire that was 
connected to a battery, a voltaic cell as it was called in that time. Voltaic cell is after the name of an Italian physicist Alessandro Volta. So these batteries had recently been invented and he had a compass needle. So can you focus on the compass needle? Ms. Pizza, zoom in, compass needle. Okay. Alright, so the compass needle basically is a piece of magnetic material. It's like a dipole, I'll explain what that is. And uh, this red is pointing in the direction of north. Okay, so this is the north direction and the compass here is placed perpendicular to the wire. Okay, so this is our north direction, the red is pointing in that direction actually. And now what I would like to do, I have a power supply and I would like to make a current flow through this, through this wire. Could anyone describe what is expected to happen to this magnetic compass? The needle, the needle will deflect, the needle will oscillate. Okay, let's see. So I'm turning on a power supply. Turning on the voltage, you probably can't see the current here, but nothing, you just focus on the compass needle, the, the current is steadily going up, it's about 0.1 amperes, nothing, ha nothing is happening to the needle, it's, the current is steadily going up, the needle is where it actually is, it's not quivering, it's slightly quivering, but it's not really changing its position. The current has now gone up to 0.5 amperes, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 amperes. It's a big current flowing, 0.9, 1 amperes, nothing happens. Okay? I turn off the current. Okay. So, Contrary to your prediction, nothing has actually happened to the magnetic compass. Alright? Yes. No, it doesn't. It, this is a DC source. So we are passing a current through a wire and your expectation was that the magnetic compass will quiver. But nothing is actually happening. So now I'll, I'll make another off. This is what uh, Orsted did in his class, he observed nothing. So it was an uninteresting demonstration. But what he actually then demonstrated, just by chance, is that he rotated his wire in a fashion. This is actually a, a historic reproduction of a, of a historic moment in the history of physics, the history of all of science. Okay, now we focus on the needle. Now what you have is that the wire is now this wire for zoom out this wire is now parallel to the compass needle okay so the wire is also pointing in the north south direction this is the north south direction and this is parallel to the direction of the terrestrial magnet okay so now the compass is parallel to this wire now he turned on the current again let's see what happens Can you see the needle move? <coughs> the needle is actually changing its its orientation. It's 
it's actually going clockwise. Okay, it has significantly changed its inclination and gone clockwise. Significantly. Okay, I turn the current back down and the needle goes back to, its, to where it was. Okay, so now the current is down, the current is zero, the needle has moved back to its original position. I turn back the current on, the needle has again shifted. Okay, I'm slightly decreasing the current because I don't want the circuit to heat up excessively. I turn off the current, the needle goes back to its original position. I turn it on, the, the needle deflects, and now I am back. So now the wire is parallel to the magnetic compass, to the compass needle. Passing a current through the wire deflects the wire, deflects the compass needle in a particular direction. Now let's make another modification to this experiment. Now what I would like to do, I would like to place this wire on top of the compass needle. Previously the wire was under the compass needle. Okay? Thoda sa zoom in kare. Thik hai thoda sa dekhe mujhe light shed. Okay, now the wire is above the compass needle and I pass the same amount of current through the wire. What do you expect should happen? It should be in the opposite direction. The compass needle should now deflect in the opposite direction. So I turn on the current and it goes the other way around. I turn it off, it goes back to its north-south direction. I turn on the current it goes back to where it was. Okay, so this was Oersted's original experiment from the 1820s. All right, we'll do that later. Now, can anyone give me an explanation of what's happening here? Why wasn't the magnetic compass needle deflecting when the wire was normal to the compass needle? And why is it deflecting when the wire was parallel to the compass needle? Sir, because in the previous lecture that we learned that, Unchi, sir, because in the previous lecture we learned that uh, the magnetic field is we get the magnetic field after a dot product, cross product. after a cross product. So because the wire was perpendicular, the cross product turned out to be zero. And there was no magnetic field, which caused a uh, deflection. There was no magnetic field at all. There, there, no, I don't think there was a magnetic field, but it was yeah. parallel yeah. to the current. So, see, one thing that we've learned. There are two things. Any better explanation? Any other explanation? Could you draw a diagram on the blackboard to describe this experimental outcome, this observation? Anyone? Yes. Electric field. Magnetic, magnetic field. Magnetic field like moves out and the 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 rotate like moves like rotary motion from, from the black from to the north side. So it is already in the direction of the magnetic field. So they are not perpendicular. The, the compass of the needle and the magnetic of the magnetic field are not perpendicular. That's why the needle does not deflect. But in the other experiment, they are, they are perpendicular. So Okay, that's a more or less reasonable explanation, though it could be done in a better way. You see, the first thing that we observe is the following. Whenever we have a current flowing through a wire, which is like moving charges. Remember, when I say moving charges, moving with respect to whom? Velocity is always relative. Moving with respect to all of us, I, you, everyone in this classroom who's in the lab frame sitting there, while the current is, while the charges are moving in the wire. Okay, so there is relative motion between charges and you. Okay, so the charges in your frame have a velocity and they constitute a current. That velocity is called the drift velocity. So we've observed that whenever there is a current, the magnetic compass deflects, the needle deflects. 
Now the needle can't deflect by an electric field. Because if you place a heavy big charge near the compass needle, nothing is going to happen to the compass needle. So there is some other force, some other variant of force, that's called the magnetic force. The needle deflects and it only deflects when the charges are moving, when there is current. So this moving current produces a field that's generally called the magnetic field. Okay, so there is a magnetic field, we know that. That's why the compass is deflecting. Now there were two configurations. The first configuration had the wire like this and the compass needle was like this. Now if current flows in this wire, this is the direction of the current density, okay, which is a vector. The current flows in this wire, there is a magnetic field associated with this current and it's in the, if you use the right hand rule, point your thumb in the direction of the conventional current, the field is pointing into the plane of the blackboard here and the field is pointing out of the plane of the blackboard here. So this needle can only move like this, but it's, the needle is pivoted. It cannot move vertically, it can only move horizontally. So the needle remains where it is. A torque can act on this needle such that the needle moves, goes inward here and outward here, right, like this. But it doesn't, but it can't do that because it's mechanically constrained. So the needle remains where it is. Okay, the force here is in other words acting inwards. Or, the, let's not talk about the forces right now, the magnetic field of, of the current in this region is inwards and the magnetic field is outwards. So this is the magnetic field due to the wire. And this is the direction of the magnetic field due to the earth. And that's the direction in which the compass needle is pointing. So there's a magnetic field due to the earth and a magnetic field due to the wire in this direction but the needle can't move like this because this is vertical motion for the needle so the needle remains where it is. The other possibility is that this is our wire and now the needle is parallel to the wire. So this is the direction of the earth's magnetic field. Okay? And now if you observe that if a current flows through this wire, this current will again produce a magnetic field. Okay, now what's the direction of the magnetic field? Once again, the magnetic field is going to point uh, <coughs> it's going to, you're going to use the right hand rule. It's going to point inwards here and it's going to point outwards here. Is that true? No? It's, if you point your thumb in the direction of the current and you look at the, your curved fingers, the magnetic field is pointing inwards here and the magnetic field is pointing outwards here. Okay? Now in this particular configuration, the magnetic field is pointing inwards here and the magnetic field is pointing outwards here. So this compass needle can not go into the, cannot go into the, it cannot execute vertical motion. Okay, so it cannot move like this. However, what can happen here is that this, if you, if you look at from the side, this where there's an earth's magnetic field and there's a magnetic field due to the wire and here there's an earth's magnetic field and a magnetic field due to the wire. So this compass needle sees a resultant and if you look at this resultant from the side you'll get two uh, magnetic fields, the field due to the earth and the field due to the wire, B wire and if you find the resultant of these fields you will get a field pointing in the other, in some other direction, B resultant. This B resultant is the new field that the compass needle is going to see and it's going to deflect as a result. However, this effect is not visible here. Okay? 
Remember, if you have this wire pointing in this direction and the compass needle is parallel to the wire, there's a, there's a, a component of, there's an earth's field that has a horizontal component. Okay, because the wire, let me describe this a bit, a bit better, in a better diagram. This is your, this is your wire, okay. Now, if your compass needle is above the wire, okay, compass needle is placed above the wire, agreed? If you look at this from the side, what do you observe? You have a wire and you have the tip of the compass needle. So this is what you observe from this end. Okay, you have your wire coming in, the current is coming in. Okay, it's coming straight into you, it's flowing out of the blackboard and you have your compass needle pointing towards you. This is what you observe from the from this end, correct? Now the current is flowing out of the plane of the blackboard. Okay, now this current will produce a magnetic field. How will this magnetic field look like? It will look like this. Okay, this is in pink, I'm drawing the magnetic field due to the wire. Is that correct? Now there's a magnetic field due to the wire and at the location of this needle, the magnetic field due to the wire is in this direction, B wire. Okay, correct? Now, what's the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at this location? It's outwards. So the Earth's magnetic field is pointing outwards. B Earth is outwards. Now, if I look and this configuration from the top back again, what do I have? I have a magnet, I have the earth's magnetic field pointing like this and I have the wire's magnetic field pointing like this on the location of the compass needle. So the resultant field is in this direction. So previously the compass needle was pointing in this direction, now it shifts. Okay? It shifts it moves into the plane of the blackboard. And how much does it shift? I can find out how much does, does it shift. If this angle is theta, then tangent of theta gives me the magnetic field due to the wire, its magnitude, divided by the magnetic field due to the earth. So if my rotation was about 45 degrees, then tangent of 45 is 1. So my wire is producing the same amount of magnetic field at this point approximately as the Earth's magnetic field, which is 0.5 Gauss. The Earth's magnetic field is, in Lahore, it's around 0.5 Gauss. 0.5 Gauss, 1 Gauss is 10 raised power minus 4 Teslas. So a common refrigerator magnet that you use is about 1 Tesla. So it's about 10,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. So this is why the compass needle can deflect. If the compass needle is placed below the wire, then you will observe that the magnetic field due to the wire is in the opposite direction. So the magnetic field due to the wire is pointing in this direction, so the resultant field is in the opposite direction and the needle will move in the other direction. So this is an image of this configuration when viewed from the top when viewed from this angle and this is a cross-sectional view. So whenever the compass needle is parallel to the wire, it deflects. However, if it's perpendicular to the wire, it cannot deflect. Now, take the same configuration and have your compass needle point like this. You will observe that there is no way that the magnetic field can deflect this needle if the needle is placed like this. Okay? One question, yeah? Where is the earth coming from? There are different re reasons for describing terrestrial magnetism. There is no consensus. Now, one reason is that when the earth formed, like many other planets were formed, there were magnetic rocks in the planet 
whose magnet magnetic domains or magnetizations were frozen at the time they were formed so on on the whole the earth has a dipolar structure that is the magnetic moments in the northern hemisphere are in the opposite direction to the magnetic moments in the southern hemisphere and where was that big magnetic field coming from that big magnetic field would have been coming from some uh, neutron star or 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 a supernova explosion which actually described the formation of the solar system okay so there was some source of big galactic mag magnetic field that describes the uh, magnetism of the rocks the other theory is that inside the core of the earth there are you, if you look at the internal structure of the earth there is a core outside the core there is a mantle outside the mantle there is a crust okay so the <clears throat> region between the mantle and the core there is a boundary between the mantle and the core that is called the moho which is a boundary inside the core there are two regions there is a solid region and there is a fluid region inside the interior of the core is solid where here there is a region that's sometimes called liquid sometimes called plastic semi solid so what is ob observed is that currents flow through this plastic region okay due to charges it's high pressure so the uh, so there is plasma here this is high pressure because it's under the crust and the mantle the so charges are flowing in this region they form circulating currents and they give rise to the earth's magnetic field likewise the sun will have a magnetic field okay in fact solar cycles dictate that the sun's magnetic field reverses its direction after every 11 years okay so planetary magnetism or stellar magnetism is a big field in its own regard okay all right so now i would like to move on a little bit what i would like to do now is i would like to i would like to describe more about this magnetic field okay do we have some analog to the coulomb's law the coulomb's law gives us the electric field due to a static charge Okay, because we've been dealing with static charges so far. Is there an analog to the Coulomb's law which gives us the magnetic field due to a moving charge? In fact, there is one, and that is an empirical relationship, which is called the Biot-Savart law. Biot-Savart law. and law i am putting in inverted commas because it's an experiment it's an experimental observation remember the history of electricity and magnetism is astounding because it has changed how we operate as human beings like starting from electromagnetic waves all to the modern internet age it's electromagnetic waves all everywhere so this story started probably in 1600s with gilbert he wrote a famous treatise on magnetism okay then there was complete silence for almost 200 years nothing major happened but is we don't know anything major happened by the way magnetic compasses were known to chinese and to the indians and to the arabs even in bc times so and in fact the astrolabe and the magnetic compass when the imperialists got the magnetic compass they started colonization and the whole face the whole fate of humanity changed so from 1600s to 1800s there was almost some silence 1820s or said this important experiment in the early 1800s volta invented the voltaic cell which gave you a ready source of current okay then from 1820s to about 1835 faraday in a short period of about 35 years, 15 years right after oersted's discovery he was actually instigated into experimental observations by this or by oersted's accidental discovery so faraday came up with the, with his laws of electromagnetic induction and he described forces and he talked about currents and then in 1860s 1867 maxwell 
synthesized all the electric and the magnetic forces and the fields into his four famous equations. Okay, so Maxwell comes here. And then in 1887, Hertz made electromagnetic waves for the first time. So he did the first radio communication. Okay, and then, as we all know, in 1905, Einstein talked about special relativity. And he gave a relativistic interpretation to magnetism and electricity. In fact, Einstein's paper from 1905 on special relativity is titled, do you know what it's titled? It's not titled the paper on special relativity. Do you know what it's titled? It's titled the following, on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. Okay? This was the paper's title of Einstein, in which he introduced special relativity for the first time, for which he got the Nobel Prize in physics. So long history of electromagnetism. Okay? Now, uh, and then there are other people who come along the way like Lenz. We have the Lenz's law and so on. Now, the, what is the Biot-Savart law? It's the analog to the Coulomb's law. What the Biot-Savart law says is the following. If I have a charge, Q, that's moving with a certain velocity, V. Velocity, of course, is a vector. And due to this charge, I would like to find at some point P, the magnetic field produced. Now, this velocity is relative. Suppose you are in your rest frame, the lab frame, and this charge is moving with a velocity. Okay, so you see the charge moving. Okay, someone who is moving with the charge will not see any velocity, so you will not experience any magnetic force. Okay, so this is something really strange. However, you will also see a different electric force. Now, we would like to calculate the magnetic field at point P due to this moving charge. Okay, so how do you calculate the electric field? If I make a unit vector R which points from the location, the instantaneous location of the charge to the point of observation, this is a unit vector and the velocity vector, these vectors can move anywhere in space. You can take this vector and draw a parallel vector here, correct? Now there are two vectors, the velocity vector and the position vector, unit vector. According to the Biot-Savart law, the magnetic field here, which of course is a vector, is given by mu naught, which is the permeability of free space, as I told you in the previous lecture, divided by 4 pi. This 4 pi makes the units easier to keep track of. Mu naught over 4 pi. Q, the charge, could be positive or negative. The velocity V, cross product with the unit vector R, divided by r square, where r is this distance. Okay? So it's an inverse square law, like the Coulomb's law. This is an r square. This r doesn't have, its magnitude is 1. Okay? At some other instant, when the charge has moved to a new location, and it's moving with a constant speed, the speed, the velocity vector doesn't change, but the radial vector does change okay, because it's a new direction with respect to the instantaneous position. So the force, is, so the magnetic field at this point is continuously going to change if this charge is moving. But at any one instant, this is what the magnetic field is going to look like. Okay, yes. So if, suppose, uh, I have two questions. Uh, for, why did we consider relative velocity when we were doing uh, electrodynamics for this current, when we're setting DC currents, why did we talk about relative velocity? Why did we not talk about them? Yes. Because it's already difficult to understand electrodynamics and you would like to impose relativity on top of it. We like to keep things simple. Secondly, sir, for instance, if I have a spaceship and uh, I'm, I'm inside the spaceship and I have some sphere of charge, like I have a Van de Graaff generator with me there. Now there's charge there and according to somebody on Earth, that charge is moving. <coughs> 
So, so someone who's on Earth will see a magnetic field. Okay. Someone who's on the sea, who's on the spaceship, will not see a magnetic field, but he may see a different electric field. Someone who's on Earth will see a, may see a different electric field. The net effect is that the force that at any point in universe on an, on an object that two observables in different frames see will be the same. The electric field and the magnetic fields will be different in such a way that the force on an, on, uh, on an of, uh, object at some point in space is going to be identical because physics does not change upon with the frame of reference. Okay? It's, Okay, if I have if I have a sphere of charge and I'm at rest with respect to it, I don't see a magnetic force. I don't see a magnetic field. But if I'm moving with respect to it, I do see a magnetic force or a magnetic field. <coughs> okay? If the charge is moving with me, I don't see a magnetic force. But I can I will see see an electric electric field. Okay, someone who's in another frame of reference may see a different electric field. The electric field will change because of length contraction or time dilation. <coughs> and this is my topic of discussion when I come to the fourth point. Not today, in a couple of weeks. So this is the bios of outlaw. With the help of one charge which is moving, we can find out the magnetic field at any location in space. Okay, and remember, that like Coulomb's law, this law has a limitation. It does not include time. Suppose this charge is moving with a velocity. I see a magnetic field here. <laughs> this charge suddenly stops. The observer here does not know that the magnetic that this moving charge has actually stopped. So the magnetic field will persist for a certain time. Okay? And it will only be after a certain time delay which is equal to this distance divided by the speed of light when this observer will know that the charge has come to rest and he will cease to feel a magnetic field. Okay? So that's why even when the effect has gone, magnetic fields persist for some time, just like electric fields persisting for some time. Okay? This is the concept of retardation. <coughs> okay. Now we can modify this formula a little bit. Suppose I have eng I, I now have a wire. I know that in a wire I have electrons or charges, any charges. I'm not talking about electrons because that's going to complicate things. I have some charges that are moving with a certain drift velocity. Okay? P. V D. Now I have a large number of electrons that make up the current. And I would like to find out the magnetic field at some point P. I can use the same formula. The only difference is now instead of having a single charge, I will have n charges. <coughs> okay? Now this formula will therefore be approximately equal to mu naught over 4 pi. I will replace this Q by n Q, capital N Q, the number of charges. Okay? Because if I'm at this point, I will see n charges pass through a particular location per unit time. So n cube v cross b, uh, v cross r over r square. Now remember this r is different for different sections of the wire. So I'm just considering one small section on the wire. Okay, which has a fixed r, a fixed position vector r. Okay, now if I look at this relationship, I already know that in a small volume of the wire, in a volume A, delta L of the wire, the number of charges is given by the volume of the wire multiplied by the number of charges per unit volume. This is my capital M. <coughs> okay. So I can replace, let me replace N Q V. Let me replace this by N Q A delta L V. Okay. Now what is what is this expression equal? What is N Q A V equal to? What is this equal to? It's equal to the current A or I. Sorry, I. This is equal to the current through the wire. And this delta L 
remains where it is. Now, but the right hand, left hand side is a vector, so the right hand side must also be a vector. This current is generally considered to be a scalar, so I can put a vector sign on this, on this length. And the direction of this length is the same as the direction of the current density. Okay? So, my expression for the Buos Award law can therefore be written as mu naught over 4 pi this nqv is replaced by i delta l crossed with unit vector r r square ok now if now this is one small section of the wire ok so if there are different sections of the wire each section will produce its own magnetic field so this is just a component of the magnetic field due to a small section. I, if this small section is really small, I can also write this expression in the following form: dB is mu naught over 4 pi I dL crossed with R over R square. So this form as well as the form that I've written at the top are both different variants of the same model. They are both called the Biot-Savart law. Okay. Now let's look at an example of calculating the magnetic field due to due to a wire that is actually carrying current. Suppose I have a wire of length capital L. Okay. And I would like to find the magnetic field at the point P. That is at a distance, say, <coughs> uh, x naught from the conductor and the current flowing in this direction. So this is the direction of the current density, okay? So this point, this point at which I want to find the magnetic field is at the bisector of this wire. It's right in the middle, okay? So, I can draw a plane So, this point P is on this plane and it's a horizontal plane Okay, so now what I would like to do <coughs> The current flowing this distance is L by 2 And this distance is also L by 2 I would like to break up this current carrying conductor into small sections. I would like to set up an integral. In other words, this small section, I call this distance y and I call this height dy. Okay. Now, this current flowing through this wire, which is i. The current through this wire is I, it has a certain cross section really. I would like to find out the field here. Okay. First of all, I would like to identify the direction of this field. I can use the right hand rule. Okay. What's the direction of the magnetic field at the point? direction? into the board. So the direction of the magnetic field is due to this section is into the blackboard. Okay, so I point my thumb in the direction of the current, curl my fingers here, the fingers are pointing inwards. So the direction of the magnetic field is into the blackboard. Okay, now what I would like to do, I would like to calculate how big is this force. How large is this force? Okay. First of all, if I were to look at this plane from the top, my upper this plane ko dekhu, my magnetic force will be pointing anti-clockwise, right? And the current is coming out of the plane of the black hole. Okay, so if I look from the top, magnetic field is going inwards here, coming out here, so it's anti-clockwise when I look from the top. You should be adept or you should be comfortable with making sketches of this kind. And this really means is 
that the magnetic field is a point function. It's a vector field, it changes from point to point. So this is another way of drawing a pattern of arrows like this, right? So this is the magnetic field at different points along the circumference of this path in space. And I can just connect the tails of these arrows to make this continuous circle. So there are different ways of drawing magnetic fields. Okay, don't use your mobile phone in the class. Okay, so all these different ways of magnetic field to draw. And look, electric field, if you had a static charge, we could never come up with an electric field that has this pattern. Now we have a moving charge, we can have a magnetic field that has this pattern. Okay? Alright, now I would like to calculate how big is this field, what's the magnitude of this field. So I will use the Biot-Savart law. Okay? So, whatever section I choose, whatever section I choose, the magnetic field is also always going to point into the plane of the blackboard, so I can just add up the magnitudes. So the magnitude due to this small section, which is carrying current, goes like this. dB is mu naught 4 pi, I is the current, dL is dy. Okay. The position vector has magnitude 1. So I, what I would like to do is, at this point, I would like to find the mutual angle between the position vector R and the magnetic field. Okay? So, what's the angle between the position vector and the magnetic field? Can you think about this? Will I give you one minute to think about it? in the diagram. If you make the proper diagram, you solve half of your problems. Divide it by the square of this distance. Now what is this distance? x naught squared plus y squared square root squared is just right like this. x naught is a constant. Okay? Now what is sine of 90 plus theta? cosine theta, I get mu naught over 4 pi i cosine of theta dy x naught square plus y square. Okay? Now, I will have to integrate this, but before I can do that, I can simplify this a little bit. What is the variable here? Is theta variable? Theta is variable because y is variable. So y is a variable and so is therefore so is theta. So I would like to express everything in terms of theta. My y I know equals x naught tangent of theta. 
Okay, so my dy will equal x naught secant square of theta. Okay, hence I can make this expression go in the following form mu naught over 4 pi i cosine theta remains like it is dy becomes x naught secant square theta. This x naught square plus y naught square is x naught square plus 1 plus tan square theta. But 1 plus tan square theta is simply secant square theta. So this is cancelled out. This 1 over x naught goes like this. And I am left with mu naught i over 4 pi x naught cosine theta. So I have simplified my expression a little bit. Now I would like to find out the total magnetic field is just the integral of, of this mu naught i 4 pi x naught of course there is a d theta here as well d theta okay. cosine of theta d theta now everything is a constant except for the cosine theta mu naught i 4 pi x naught cosine theta d theta now I have to choose the limit of integration on theta so what are the limits of integration Can I limits of integration? Uh, Tan inverse of? L by 2 over x. L by 2 over x. Right, correct. Be minus? From minus to positive. So from minus. Now we have to choose the limits. The lower limit is when your y is right at this point. Okay? So you have to find the angle theta when you are here. Okay? And the upper limit is the maximum value of theta when you are here. So the maximum value of theta is tangent inverse of L over 2x and the minimum is tangent inverse of minus L over 2x. So this limit is tangent inverse of minus L over 2x whereas this limit is tangent inverse of L over 2x. Okay? Now if you perform this integration which you can do on your own with these limits you should be able to perform this integration. I can ask such questions in the class, uh, in the exams. So don't expect that I will give you a table to, do, to find this out. You will have to perform this integration. The integral is sine theta. So I get mu naught i 4 pi x naught. I get sine theta as my integral. And I put in the limits tangent inverse L by 2x tangent inverse minus L by 2x. So the limits are the extreme values of theta. When theta is the upper limit, so then this theta is tangent inverse of L over 2 divided by x naught. And likewise you have the lower limit. Okay? So can you find the value of sine theta when theta equals this and when theta equals this? Is it possible? Could you give it a shot? I would like to see if you can substitute these angles in sine theta and what, do, what would you get? Could you please give it a shot? I will try it. कर सकते हैं आप
So I will call tangent inverse L over 2x, I will call this beta. I would like to find sine of beta in other words. So this means that tangent of beta is L over 2x. This means 1 plus cotangent square of beta which is cosecant square of beta is 1 plus 2x over L squared. But cosecant square of beta is sine square of beta. This is 1 plus 2x over L squared minus 1. This means that sine of beta is plus minus 1 over 1 plus 2x over L squared under root. Okay, so this is sine of beta. Likewise, sine of minus beta, which is the lower point, is also given by this. So I have to choose the positive and the negative signs. So <coughs> the integral b becomes mu naught i over 4 pi x naught. <coughs> For the upper limit, I choose the positive sign because the angle is positive. So I choose the positive sign, I get 1 over 1 plus 2x over L squared under root minus for the lower limit I choose the negative sign because the angle here in the lower limit is negative so I get minus of the minus of this so I get another plus here plus of the same thing I get a 2 here so this is my result this is the magnetic field due to the current carrying by of length L now if I make a simplification if my x naught is much smaller than L which means that I am very close to the current carrying conductor or in other words this current carrying conductor is really large then I can have the simplification that this L over 2x is really small because 2x is much smaller than L to first approximation what I could do, I could ignore this. If I use the binomial expansion, you can do it properly. You can just ignore this. I can get mu naught i over 2 pi x naught. This equals b approximately when my current carrying conductor is really large. <coughs> so this seems somewhat similar to the following fact that if you have a wire that is charged with uniform charge density lambda and if you are at a distance x naught from the wire then the electric field here is simply going to be lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught x naught correct if you have a wire that is charged and you are at a distance x naught from this infinitely long wire then the electric field at this point is simply equal to lambda the charge in C divided by two, a factor of 2 pi epsilon naught and the distance here if you have an infinitely long current carrying conductor and you find the magnetic field due to this infinitely long current carrying conductor what you have is Instead of epsilon naught, you have mu naught. But if this is in the denominator, this is in the numerator. Okay? Instead of this lambda, you have the current now. A current density, a charge density produces electric field, a current density produces a magnetic field. And you have the same x naught and you have the same 2 pi factor here. This 2 pi factor comes out because we have included this factor of 4 pi in the definition of the Bios about law. If we didn't have this factor, then we could not find out the symmetry in the formulas. So this factor of 4 pi ensures that there is some symmetry between the formulas we get in with, between the magnetic and the electric fields. Okay. Now I give you one minute to digest this while we move on to our next discussion. Finding out the field due to current and loops.
further away from the coil, the effect of the, magnet, the small the magnetic field will become smaller. Turn on the current. Of course, it's a much feebler oscillation. So I move away along the axis of this coil. I move further away, the magnetic field diminishes. And it diminishes in a particular pattern. And that diminishing is 1 over x cube. Just like the diminishing of an electric field from an electric dipole. So we already have the idea that this loop is acting like a magnetic dipole. Okay. Now let's move this compass back again. And now I will, instead of putting this compass along the axis, ye metal hai. I will put it on top of the solenoid. Now let's see what, if I turn on the current, let's see what's going to happen. What do you expect is going to happen? Nothing? Outside. Electric field, not a more electric field. <laughs> Nothing or something. S small deflection in the same direction. Let's see. Learn by observing. This is how physics evolves. All of electricity magnetism evolved through experiments. Theory came later. In the opposite direction, yes. It has now moved in the opposite direction. Okay. It goes in the opposite direction to when it went when it was inside the solenoid. So if I were to plot the magnetic field due to this current carrying loop of wire. Instead of making a circular loop, I, instead of making a rectangular loop, I would make a circular loop. The magnetic field approximately looks like this. And outside, it just spirals back like this. So this is how the magnetic field is looking like. So all these lines are the same plane. So I'm looking at the vertical plane. All of them are in the same vertical plane. Here it goes like this. So notice that the direction of the magnetic field inside this coil is opposite to the direction outside the coil. Because the property of these magnetic field lines is that if a field line starts somewhere, it cannot end on, on anything because there are no magnetic charges. There are no magnetic monopoles. There could be electric monopoles which are called point charges. But there are no magnetic monopoles so far that have been discovered. Even though people are trying very hard to discover magnetic monopoles, there are none discovered so far. And please, mobile phone pe kaam karna. Mobile phone pe karna? Sorry. So, ye the magnetic field lines hai, they have to curve in upon themselves. They cannot end on any magnetic charges or any magnetic poles. So this is the approximate uh, direction of the magnetic field due to this current carrying loop. And if I have a bar magnet, sorry, if I have a bar magnet, now one really bad way of drawing bar magnet is putting a, a putting a line in the middle of the bar magnet and putting a north here and a south here. This is not how a magnet is formed. This is a totally misleading representation of a bar magnet. Okay, So I don't want to draw diagrams of this kind. I would just like to have the magnet drawn like this. And if the need arises, I will just draw an arrow. Okay. So the magnetic field due to a bar magnet will actually look very similar to the magnetic field that I have drawn here for a current carrying loop. So this current carrying loop is actually acting like a small bar magnet, like a tiny magnet. This is called a dipole. 
magnetic dipole. <laughs> and what we are interested now is that I will finish this off as a, as a homework because and I expect that before you come for the next class you will actually solve this problem. What I would like you to do, I would like you to take a circular loop of wire okay, that is carrying a current. Okay, let, let, let's draw this horizontally. Take a circular loop of wire. It's in the horizontal plane. It's carrying some current. Let's call this the x-axis, the y-axis. Let's call this the z-axis. So this is in the x-y plane with z at z equals 0. This disc, it's not a disc, it's a, it's a ring. This ring has a radius capital R and this current flowing through it, this is the direction of the current density. Now what I would like to do, I would like to take a point on the axis, point P, such that this distance is Z0, some Z, Z0. And I would like to find out the magnetic field due to this current okay inside the loop what i would like you to do i would like you to first of all determine the direction of the magnetic field using the biosi watt law i would like you to break up this loop into small sections find the direction of magnetic field into each section find the magnitude of the uh, loop uh, of the current carrying loop to each section and then integrate and find the total magnetic field here and then what happens if I move this point closer and closer to the loop? Eventually I come here. What I would like this the result to be is that this current carrying loop is acting like a dipole, but now a magnetic dipole. So a single pair of charges, opposite charges, acts like an electric dipole, whose field, electric field falls off as the cube of the distance if you're far away from it. This would act like a magnetic dipole whose magnetic field falls off as the 1 over the cube of the distance from the center of this current carrying loop. And these current carrying loops are really important because an electron inside an atom is also modeled by the same current carrying loop. The electron in a certain angular momentum state also has a current carrying loop, it also has a magnetic moment and that is where magnetism comes from. Okay, so in the next lecture, we'll probably look at more at the different kinds of magnetic materials and we'll build up from this concept. And the tutorials will resume from next week as well. Over the weekend, we're going to upload the marks of the midterms as well. Okay, thank you very much.